Good morning. I'm Lady Jess, and I want to welcome you to the Main Street Church of God in Christ. We are so excited to have you worshiping with us this morning, and we pray that you will be blessed by the worship and word. And so again, welcome and let's have church.
you this morning to be dining with us in this Sunday morning service. Thank you for taking care of us all week long. We ask you to bless our service today. We ask you to take hold of our minds so that we will hear from you. We ask that you cover, bless, and use our pastor this morning as a vessel for you. We ask that you anoint everyone who will take part in this service today. May you send your Holy Spirit in this place to give us understanding of you, Father. We ask that you heal our diseases and meet our, our needs today. We ask you to increase our love for each other and for even those that who are persecuted against us. Please help us to know your ways that we may walk in them forever. We worship you this day in truth and in spirit. In Jesus' name, we pray and believe. Amen. I will be coming from 128 numbers of Psalm, start with verses 1 to 4. And it reads, Blessed is everyone that fears the Lord, that walk in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thy hands. Happy shall thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the side of thy house. Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that fears the Lord. Amen. Someone just Say the name Jesus, hallelujah. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, hallelujah. The very mention of his name. We'll see the day that every knee shall bow and every tongue is gonna proclaim that he is the King of Kings, hallelujah. That he is the Lord of Lords, hallelujah. But until we see that day, we're just gonna proclaim that he is all that here on earth, hallelujah, until kingdom comes, hallelujah, Jesus, because God, you are our savior, hallelujah, you are our God.
up, say Jesus. We love you. 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 We love you.
He's the only true and living God. Hallelujah. We bless your name. Hallelujah. We praise you. And we say, you're the only living God. Say, you're the only living God. If you believe it, open up your mouth and sing it with us. The only living God. right where you are come on right where you are go ahead and give the praise team a hand we thank God that they function in such excellence singing the name of Jesus because it's at the name of Jesus that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord put your hands together one more time for the praise team and for Jesus we greet you in divine love this morning on this first Sunday in February 2022 and we thank God that he's brought us yet this far and we're thanking him for what he's going to continue to do in, the, in our lives and in the lives of those around us and so even now we pray and ask that you would like and share to do your part in digital evangelism uh, because we know that uh, by this way we're able to get this word and this worship into the stratosphere of those who actually need it this morning we want to say thank you so much to all of you it's Sunday morning and we thank God that he has kept us uh, until now we greet all of you in the name of Jesus Christ all of you our visitors we thank God for all of you all the friends and the family of the Main Street Church of God in Christ and if you are visiting with us if you are not yet a member of the Main Street Church of God in Christ I want you to put that in the comment section I am a member and Main Street, I want you to go absolutely crazy and greet our visitors. We want you to know that we indeed are the church that loves people. We love you and we are so excited that you are worshiping with us this morning. There's so many other places that you could be, so many other broadcasts that you could be tuned into. But the very fact that you saw fit to come in and to see about us here at the Main Street Church of God in Christ, we don't take it lightly. And we want to say thank you to you main street one more time go ahead put some fire in that chat put some hand clap emojis in that chat send up some hearts and some likes for our visitors 
because we thank you so much for being with us. And even now, we're continuing to pray for all of you, all of those who say pray for me. Uh, looking forward to what the Lord is going to do in our lives. We're continuing to pray even for the Stocker family as yesterday they celebrated the home going of Pastor Harvey Stocker. And we thank God for the excellence of our church that we function in. And we thank God that we have another soldier that has gone on to glory. Because at the end of the day, the reason we're living this life, come on somebody, is because we don't want to be lost. We want to hear him say, well done. And whenever we have a soldier who graduates on to glory, we sorrow not as those who have no hope. But we're able to give God glory, honor, and praise because it indeed worked. Amen. And we're continuing to pray for all of those who are sick and shut in even now. And we thank God how he's going to open doors, make ways, and change lives for the better. So even now, we're preparing our hearts to get ready for the word of God. And, and we thank God for that word that's coming forth even now. And we're asking and soliciting your prayers this morning uh, as we bring to you what the Lord has given to us. And so even now, we are asking that you would pray uh, for the music ministry as they come back to prepare our hearts for the word. Say amen for them as they come.
open up your mouth and bless the name of Jesus. We bless the wonderful name, hallelujah, of Jesus. Hallelujah. There's something about that name, hallelujah. It's got to be something when they say that demons tremble at the name Jesus, hallelujah. There's something about that. thank God for this praise team yet again uh, for the anointing that they flow in we thank God for them preparing the way for the word preparing your hearts uh, for the word and we're not going to prolong the time at all uh, we're going to get right to the word and if you would if you could turn in your Bibles to 2nd Kings chapter number 5 we're going to read the first 14 verses verse 1 through verse number 14 and we thank God for the word of the Lord we thank God for the power of the word uh, and even now if you have not shared if you have not liked go ahead and do that like and share and when you shared this morning uh, put that one word in the comment section shared I promise you somebody needs to get this word this morning second Kings chapter number five verse one through verse number 14 if you would somebody put that in the comment section uh, so that those who are coming in now and even those who will come in later will be able to lock in with us uh, on the same page as it relates to the word 2 Kings chapter 5 verse 1 through 14 and we're going now to the word already in progress Amen uh, There's a word from the Lord today and I'm soliciting your prayers even now uh, that God would give me how to give you <laughs> what he gave to me but I'm going to need y'all to pray. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, pray for the preacher. Please pray for the preacher. Please pray for the preacher. Uh, but this morning, we're going to go in our Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter number 5. Uh, and we're going to read uh, what seems like a lot, but it's really not that much. Uh, so I'm not even going to ask you to stand up. Uh, we're going to read verses 1, verse 1 through verse 14. And in those verses, we will uh, find our assignment uh, for this morning. Even to our online audience, if you would put that in the comment section, 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1 through verse 14. Uh, when you have it, would you say amen? Here's what the Bible says. Now, Naaman, captain of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor. Here it is. But he was a leper. Say he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, 
would God my Lord were the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. The king of Syria said, Go to go. And I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel saying, Now with, when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive? That this man does send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy. Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. It was so when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariots and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought... He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and, and Farpa rivers of Damascus better than all the rivers of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And the sermons came near and spake unto him and said my father if the prophet had bid thee to do something great wouldest not thou not have done it how much rather then when he had when he had when he said to thee wash and be clean then he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the saying of the man of God and his flesh uh, came again he came again and his flesh was like unto a child and he was clean. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his holy word. Uh, for the next few moments, we're going to tag this text, it's going to work. It's, it's going to work. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, it's going to work, it's going to work, it's going to work. Put that in the comment section. Tag somebody, text that. Let them know that, the God, that God has a plan for your life and it's going to work. Uh, some of you may remember uh, it was back in 1999, I really don't know what I was thinking, but I enlisted in the United States Navy right out of high school. Lord, help me, Jesus. <laughs> and, and from that experience, I learned so much about myself, and I learned so much about uh, my limits and pushing myself to the limits because that experience literally pushed me to my emotional, my physical, and my mental limits. And when I think back on, on that time, uh, that there were a few memories from that time, from that experience that I will never forget. The first thing that, that, that came to mind is that I remember it was when we got there to, to the station in, in Great Lakes, Illinois. Uh, we got there and after we had got processed in, uh, they said, now it's time to go to the barber shop. Because uh, we had to get our hair cut uh, right out of the gate. And I knew, y'all, that it was going to be an issue because when I looked in the barbershop and I saw the person who was cutting hair, he didn't look like me at all, read between the lines. And I could tell immediately by looking at all of the heads of them that went before me that his goal was not quality, it was quantity. Uh, so long story short, when I sat down in the chair, I was only in the chair about three minutes and he whacked all of my hair off of my head, and my head was messed completely up. So y'all know how we are in our communities. We don't play about a couple of things. We don't play about our money. Yeah, we don't play about our family. And as men, we don't play about our haircuts. And so that was a struggle for me, for me so much so that I never forgot that 
experience. But then there was another experience that I, that I vividly remember. And I remember that we had gotten about halfway through basic training, y'all, and it had gotten really, really tough because, because the drill sergeants were yelling at us every day. And we were running miles and miles every single day. And we had some people in our company that seemingly just couldn't get right. Every time we looked up, they was doing something wrong. And we kept on having to work out and run and work out and run. And I remember that one time we were in the, in the barracks and they had what they call a rain party. And what that is is that we were all in the barracks and we were all working out so long and so hard until condensation started forming on the ceilings and the walls and the water was coming down like it was raining in the building. And I remember it was getting really rough and it was getting really tough because they had only allowed us to make one phone call home. And so we were struggling through it and I'm reading my Bible. I'm trying to do the best I can. And I remember that I heard the words that really blessed my soul. They said, uh, this Sunday, we're going to have church call. And, uh, and you know when you're struggling and you're going through something, things are tough. When you hear that you can go to church. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I, what I need. And so, and, and so I said, I'm going to church call. I signed up for church call. But, but when I got there, I was a little underwhelmed. Because this was Navy church. It wasn't our kind of church. And so they were sitting in there and they were singing they, the songs, you know, thank you for the trees. I said, oh, Lord, the rivers and the streams. I said, Lord Jesus. And so I'm struggling through that because, you know, in our culture, our songs come out of the problems we have. We, we song, sing songs like, help me, help me, Lord. <laughs> yeah, get more power. Yo, power, Lord. That was the kind of song we sang. You know, Lord, we need you to rain down on us because we sing songs that are connected to our experience. And I remember, y'all, that I, I was praying and I said, God, I need something. I need my, my batteries charged. I'm running on low. And I remember that one Sunday we went to church call. And I don't know how the Lord does. He has a way. I'm trying to tell you God has a way. But I remember going in and they went through the normal spiel and I was just not touched by the music at all. And when they got done, y'all, I start hearing this faint little sound because some kind of way there must have been a, a, a musician that was in, in, in basic training and the boy had to be coaching. Because off in the distance I heard this here right here. See y'all, see, see the, the words of the song are yes Lord. And, and I, was, I was sitting there in church. And I was struggling and I heard the, the words, yes, Lord. And, and I was sitting there, y'all, and I was, I was about to blow up. I was about to boil over. And, and I was sitting there. And just when I almost lost it, there must have been another Kojic boy on the other side of the building. Because he lost it and he went crazy and started screaming. <laughs> he went crazy in there, y'all. And then I understood why the Lord let him go first, you see, because... Then the, the, the security came and got him, but they didn't come get me because I stayed in my seat. <laughs> and, but I was sitting there, my eyes was closed, and I was listening to the song, Yes, Lord. And, and my batteries just start charging up, and I, I just feel like I can go a little further. I feel like I can fight a little more because way down in my soul, my, my answer was still yes. And if the Lord would walk with me, and if he would talk with me, and if he would help me, I could make it through it. So that was the second thing. That stuck to me. But the third thing, y'all, that really, really got me is uh, in order to graduate, listen to me, from basic training, you had to be swim qualified. Now, that's okay if, come on, somebody, if you can swim. But, uh, you know, sometimes in, in our communities, that's just not, you know, some of the stuff. We, we can barbecue, but we can't all swim. Yeah, we, we know how to make ends meet, but we can't all swim. <laughs> we can fix anything with a hammer and vice grips, but we can't all swim. And I was in there, and I, and I walked in, they said, we gonna, you're going to have to qualify to swim. I said, man, I can't swim. He said, I ain't asked you if you could swim. I said, well, well, how, well how, how is this supposed to work now? That, you know, I'm, I don't understand. If I can't swim, and you telling me I got to be swim qualified, how is this going to work? And so I'm standing in line, and I'm praying, Lord Jesus. See, y'all know every now and then you get in some of them situations where you know you can't handle it on your own, and you start praying silently, even if ain't nobody listening. You just, you just need heaven to help you. And I'm sitting, I said, Lord, you're going to have to tell me how to get, either I'm going to have to fall out, 
I'm going to have to run and, and act like I'm crazy. I'm going to have to do something because I'm not going to jump in this water and drown. And so I'm standing there and I'm walking there and I'm getting closer and closer. And finally, y'all, I'm next. And the closer I got, I realized how tall the diving board was. And I'm standing on the ground and I'm looking at it and it looked like it's about 20 or 30 feet in the air. And I'm saying, now this is already a problem because I can't swim. The pool is about 10 feet deep. But the platform is 20 feet in the air. That don't add up. I don't care who you are and where you are. That math don't add up if you can't swim. And so I remember y'all, Lord have mercy, hold me right in through here. I'm, I'm walking and I get a little closer. And I look to the man and I said, listen, man, I just got to tell you something. The other man didn't listen to me. He said, what is it? I said, I can not swim. He said, you can't swim. I said, no, I can't swim. He says, well, you ain't got to swim. All you got to do is jump. Ooh, Lord, hold me through here. I said, what, what do you mean? All I got to do is jump. He said, you can jump, can't you? I said, yeah, I can jump, but I can't swim. He says, he says here's what I need you to know. He says, you ain't got to be able to swim. He said, because I can. I said, what, what, how, how you being able to swim going to help me? He said, here's how it's going to work, son. He said, when you jump and you hit the water, he said, all I need you to do is wrap your arms around yourself and just let yourself go down. He said, don't fight the water. Don't start swinging your arms. He said, that's all I need you to do. I, that ain't enough assurance. I told you I can't swim. And that ain't swimming. Jumping in water, going straight down, ain't swimming. That means I'm going straight to the bottom. So I get on the front of the thing. I said, Lord, just forgive me of all my sins, just in case. Uh, this don't work. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. And I got to the edge of the platform, y'all. Guess what I did? I jumped. And I closed my eyes, and it seemed like I was falling forever. So I'm preaching to somebody already. Seemed like I was falling forever. And finally, I hit the water. And when I hit the water, I remember what he said on the platform. That if you just wrap your arms around yourself. He said, don't fight. He said, don't try to beat the water. He said, just let yourself fall. And so I closed my eyes. I'm holding my breath. And I'm falling. And I'm going down. I said, I, I, I could tell I was getting deeper and deeper. And I'm just holding myself. And can I tell y'all what happened? Before my feet hit the bottom of the pool, I felt some arms wrap around me. And here it is, I can't swim, but I felt myself coming to the top. I'm not kicking y'all, I ain't moving, I ain't swinging my arms. But I feel myself coming to the top. And I could see the light was getting a little closer. I could see I was coming out on the other side. And when I got on the top of the wall, I opened my eyes and looked at the man who helped me. He says, here's what I tried to tell you. I'm trying to help you understand that if you just listen to what I say and do what I say, even if you can't do it, it's going to work. And I'm trying to tell somebody under the sound of my voice that you may be struggling in something that it seems like you can't fix. You may be going through something that it seems like you can't get together. But the Lord told me to tell you that I have a plan for your life. And if you do it my way, it's going to work. Tell your neighbor, it's going to work. It's going to work. It's going to work. My mama got to be. Mm -hmm. It's going to work. So I'm going to show you something out of this text. I really done already done preach. It, it's going to work. I'm trying to get somebody to understand. That you're going through, seem like you're going through the motions and seem like you're going down. But I'm trying to tell you that if you don't fight against him. In fact, if you hold your peace and let the Lord fight your battles, victory shall be yours. Look at another neighbor and tell him, it's going to work, it's going to work, it's going to work. Oh, Lord. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I just need a few minutes. I want to show you something out of this text real quick and I'm going to get out your way. Because this text, uh, second, second Kings chapter 5, uh, it's one of the most powerful texts that I've ever read. There's so much in it that I'm, I tried to get as much as I could to show you uh, what the Lord showed me out of this text. But I'm going to give you these three things, I promise you, and I'm going to get out of your way. But when you look at Naaman's story in the text, uh, he, he is the captain of the host of the armies of Syria. He's a powerful man. He is a man of affluence and stature. 
But if we look at Naaman's story, he shows us how. If we do things God's way, it's going to work. So, so first thing I want to show you in this text is that it, it's going to work. Point number one. But you have to accept help from the right people. Go, okay, go to verse number, uh, verse number two. Verse number two. Uh, chapter five, verse two. Look, look, look what it says. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid and she waited on Naaman's wife. Verse 3. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord wear with the prophet that is in Samaria for he would recover him of his leprosy. Now, now I want you to see, I want you to understand again that, that Naaman is a man of power. He's a man of affluence. He's a man of means. He, he was a national and international figure, and, and his name carried weight throughout the Eastern world. He was so powerful. He was the type of person that when he would walk in a room, that everybody would stand at attention, and everybody in the entire nation knew his name. But even though he was a man of power and prominence, Beneath Naaman's armor, y'all, he had a real problem. Because even though he was a world leader, the text says that he also was a leper. Stay with me, stay with me. So, so on the outside, he was the picture of success and strength. But beneath his armor, the man was really sick. On the, on the outside, it looked like he had it all together, but beneath his armor, he was literally falling apart. On the outside, it looked like he had everything, looked like he had it all, but beneath his armor, he had an issue that if it was exposed, it would cost him everything. But you have to remember that because of leprosy, y'all, that you had to be put or quarantined to a leper colony because the disease that he had was so crippling and contagious it was 10 times worse than COVID because you can get COVID and you can recover but if you get leprosy the nose fall off and fingers fall off and your flesh start rotting so this man is struggling with the situation he has but here it is but it's hidden underneath his armor so if he's a leper that means he cannot be a military leader so Naaman uh, he has, has power but he has to always wear his armor in public because all of his power and his possessions were attached to his position. I'm trying to help somebody. So, 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 so many people, we can identify uh, with Naaman's story because Naaman, y'all, would only show people the parts of himself that he wanted them to see. Then he would get by himself and then he would suffer in silence. So he, in public, he would never take off his armor. Because he was afraid of people seeing his affliction. I want you to see how tired and exhausted uh, uh, Naaman is. He's living uh, an exhausting existence because he can never allow anybody to get too close to him. Because he has a secret, y'all, that can't get outside of his circle. Uh huh. And, but, but that's why Naaman figures out in the text that you have to accept help from the right people. Because Naaman is sick, y'all. But I, wanna, I want y'all to see who offers him the solution. Go, go back to verse 2. I'm going to show you to you. It's right there in the text. It, it says, And the Assyrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, y'all see it? And she waited on Naaman's wife. So, so remember now, Naaman is a man of power and position. This means he has access to the most powerful people in Syria, the most powerful politicians. He had access to the smartest medical scientists. And he had personal audience with the king and his entire cabinet. But even though all of those people had power and status, none of them had the solution that would fix his problem. But there was a little slave girl in his house that many of us would look at this girl and say she's a nobody, but here it is, she knew somebody. And, and, and I need somebody to understand that, that, that even though we are not anything uh, in and of ourselves outside of Jesus, I'm trying to tell you, I know somebody. 
yeah, that he has all power in his hands and where my pockets are too short and where my hands are too weak. I know the very ancient of days, the God of heaven, and he can handle your case. With all of the status that Naaman has, with all of the people that Naaman knows, his cure comes through a slave girl's connections. Lord have mercy. But, but I want you to know now that this slave girl, yeah, she, she, she's in the house and, and she's able to identify that Naaman is sick. But, but here's what I need you to know, though. That Naaman didn't show her, she just saw it. <laughs> okay. So, so, so he has mastered hiding himself and holding on to his secret. But here's a slave girl that's in his circle and she sees what he's not trying to show. Can I tell you that the Lord will always put somebody around you who can see the stuff that you ain't even trying to show. That's why you ought to come to church whenever you get an opportunity because sometimes you'll walk in church and you're down in your spirit and somebody will look at you and say, yeah, I've been through it. You're going to be all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll walk in and you don't feel like you can make it and, and the weight of the world is on your shoulders. Somebody will look you right in your eyes and say, the Lord told me to tell you that everything is going to be all right. You'll be sitting right in your seat and the choir will sing a song that say, put it in the hands of the Lord because he can handle it this and that. He can handle it. That's a fact. He allows somebody to see the stuff even when you ain't trying to show it. But I want y'all to understand something because some of us got to reevaluate our circles because what the text shows us is, is that this slave girl uh, uh, is the type of person you want on your side. Not because she has status, but because she's a person of substance. So you say, well, how, well, how do you know, Pastor, she's a, not a person of status, but she's a person of substance? Well, let the Bible tell you. Because first of all, we know that she's not a person of status because she's a slave. And, and the slaves... Uh, were on the bottom rung of society. So she didn't have no status. But the way that we know, stay with me, that she is a person of substance is because after she saw his sickness, she never exposed it. Okay, I'm going to show you. You, you got to understand that there are some people that don't understand what the church is for. Our ministry is not the ministry of humiliation. It's the ministry of reconciliation. And, and you have to understand that there, that, there, that there are some people who feel that it is their personal responsibility to publicize everybody else's problems. And usually that person is the one who got the most problems. And so they throw your stuff out there to get your eyes off them. I'm trying to help you understand something. It, it's some people around us that are waiting for you to fall so they can put it on Facebook. I'm, I'm trying to tell you that some people uh, around you are doing everything that they can to try to expose uh, what's going on underneath your armor, but people of substance will not shine light on your sickness. But they'll stand with you to help you get better. And it don't mean that they cover your sin. They'll tell you the truth. Yeah, you sick. But here's the good news. There's a bomb in Gilead. There is a physician there. And I'm going to walk with you through to deliverance and they'll keep it a secret because a good man concealeth a thing. I need you to, I need you to understand. That's why the Bible says that ye who, which are spiritual restore such a one if your brother be overtaken in the fall. Because some folks ain't spiritual enough to see folk when they're down. Some folks forget, I'm talking about flat foot forget where he brought them from. There's some people that you, when you look at them and you talk to them, you would think, that the Lord saved them because it gave glory to his name. You would think that that resume was so good that God needed them in order to make him look good. But I'm trying to tell you that all of us were wretched and undone and all of us were saved and delivered from something unless you're still in it. Mm -hmm. So when she sees his sickness, she doesn't expose him but here's the second way that she knows that she's a person of substance. Because she never abused her access to him. Okay, I want, I want to show you. She, she, she's a slave girl. I'm trying to move. I'm trying to get somewhere. She, she's a slave girl, y'all. And she knows a secret that would destroy him. But she never used what she knew about him 
to manipulate him. She, she never used it. Y'all got to remember now, she, she's a slave. So she could have said, in exchange for my freedom, I connect you to the prophet who can help you uh, be, be healed. But that's not what she does. She, she could have used what she knew about him to get anything she wanted from him because his whole life, his existence, and his quality of life was attached to this secret. But she never used his secret against him because she was genuinely concerned with helping him. I'm talking about the real saints. Well, here's how you know. There's another reason why you know that she's a person of substance. Because when she offers the solution to Naaman for his sickness, she did not go directly to Naaman and tell him. Verse 2 says, and she said unto her mistress. I want y'all to see that in verse 2. She didn't go directly to Naaman and say, I know somebody that can fix your situation. She went to Naaman's wife. Here's why. Because she didn't work directly for Naaman. She worked for Naaman's wife. So, so here it is. that she, We can see that she's a person of substance because even though she knows about the problem, she still never broke protocol. Uh huh. She, she sees something in him that she can use to expose him. But she goes to his wife and says, I got a solution for the problem. Now, now if that would have been some of us, I, I can't even look at y'all through here. If that had been some of us, saved, sanctified, and filled with the precious Holy Ghost and with fire, uh, some of us right now let you find out something embarrassing about your boss, especially if you don't like him. Uh huh. Let you find out something about him. That don't nobody know that we ruined their name at the office. Okay, let, let you find out something that they did wrong that if you told it, you could get them fired. Just, just let you, let some of us, I'm talking about some of us right in here sitting in the seat you sitting in. Some of us right now. If you found out something about your boss or somebody that you did not like at your job, from that very moment, as far as you're concerned, None of the rules don't apply to you no more. If your boss done something, you can get him fired if you tell it. Oh, no. I can get to work whenever I feel like it. Don't say nothing to me. I'm going to go to lunch when I feel like it. And when I come to work, I really didn't come to work. Come on, somebody. And, and you're looking at your boss like, and you better not say nothing. Because the moment you say something, I'm going to tell everybody. Because many times when we find out stuff like that about people, there's many of us that will use it against other people, but that is not a person of substance. Even though she could have benefited from using the information, she did not use it to ruin him, but she still followed the rules. I'm preaching to somebody. I'm trying to help somebody. But the text shows us that uh, you have to accept help from the right people. It's not always people of status. You need people around you that are people of substance. Y'all know I'm so tired of professional name droppers. That every time they come around you, they, they want to tell you, now you working at Walmart where I work, but you want to tell me LeBron James is your cousin. It ain't help you, and it ain't help me neither. And if LeBron ain't going to come get us, don't tell me who you know. That don't, I can get on the phone right now and call the president. So what? If he ain't going to eliminate my student loans, <laughs> if he ain't going to change my life, then it don't matter to me who you know. But there's some people that only look for people of, of status, but you don't need people of status as much as you need people of substance. I hope you get it. I hope you're seeing it. So you got to make sure that you, that you accept help from the right people. But here's the second thing. But you have to choose humility and reject your pride. Okay, go to, go to verse 9. Verse 9. I'm not moving. I'm almost where I need to be. Verse 9. Look what it says. So Naaman came with his horses. Lord, this is really funny. And with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elijah. <laughs> and Elijah sent a messenger unto him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shall be clean. Now, now remember that, that, that it's the slave girl in the house that tells Naaman of a solution, tells his wife of a solution that if he goes to see Elijah that he can be, be healed. But y'all got to remember something. Remember now where the girl was from and how she got to Naaman's house in the first place. 
Okay, I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to show it to you. Remember now, because if you look uh, at, at verse number two, it says, and the Syrians had gone out by companies, Lord, I love the word of God, and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel, that's where she's from, a little maid. Y'all see that? So, here, so here's what you got to see. The girl that gives them the solution is from Israel. And the way that she got connected to Naaman in the first place is when he led a Syrian attack on Israel and took her from her home. Stay with me. But when she tells him that she knows a prophet who can heal him, she was talking about Elijah. But guess where Elijah is from? He from Israel. Uh huh. I'm going to make it plain for you. Some of y'all read y'all Bible. I can hear you. Elijah is from Israel. And so here it is. In other words, Naaman's cure was connected to the same people he had tried to kill. Uh huh. So now he has to humble himself and go back to the same people that he hurt and ask them for help. Y'all better watch how you treat folks. You better watch how you handle people because you never know when you're going to have to go back across the same bridge. You never know who it is that God may use to open the door. You may, you may not know who it is that God is going to use to help you in situations. So now naming y'all got to humble himself and go back to the people that he beat up and say, I need y'all help. I, I want you to see what, what humility looks like. He got to eat all them words. He got to go and he can't go in talking loud like he did the first time. He can't, he can't go in there telling him to get on the ground and get out. But he can't do that this time. Because now he, he has a, a problem and they are the only people who can help him. We got to go back and ask for help. But, but here is the second thing that happens in the text, y'all, that really <laughs> makes him humble himself. It, it's right there in, in verse 9. Again, look what it says. Go in verse 9. I'm going to read it to verse 10. So Naaman came with his horses. Lord, it's funny. And with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. In verse 10, here it is. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, y'all missed it, y'all missed it, y'all missed it. Okay, I'm going to give it to you. I know you got it. I know. Uh -huh. I'm going to give it to you again. E Elijah, he goes to the house of Elijah. He got all his chariots, all his stuff. He shows up at the doorstep of Elijah. And verse 10 says, and Elijah sent a messenger unto him, saying, Okay, I'm, I'm give, let, me, let me bring it closer. Naaman is a man of prestige. And he holds a powerful position. And whenever he walks into any room in Syria, everybody stands. It, it, it's kind of like when, when the bishop walks into the church. We say, everybody stand when the bishop walk in. It, it's like if the president was to walk into the room out of respect, everybody would just stand up. So the kind of can attest to this. When, you, when, the, when the judge walks into the, into the courtroom, all rise. Because in our culture, uh, one of the ways that we honor powerful people and certain positions is we stand. But here's what you don't see in, in, in the text. We don't know if Elijah stood up or not. Primarily because when Naaman got there, he didn't even come outside. <laughs> I want y'all to see it. I want you to see it. Elijah in the house playing the game or something. He on 2K. Listen, I'm busy. I'm watching the game. <laughs> The Razorbacks playing, the Cowboys playing. I'm not even coming outside. He don't even go outside, y'all. He is still in the house. And this is a humbling experience for, for Naaman because he was used to always being honored. I want you to see how the Lord honored, uh, how, he, how he humbles him. But he, he, so he's, he's still in the house, and, and he's struggling to understand why this man didn't come outside. But I want to show you something else that's going to even make it worse. Because... In order to get from Syria, where Naaman lived, Lord have mercy, to Samaria, where Elisha was living, was right at 363 miles. I want to show you now. 363 miles. Which means that that's about five hours by car, but about five days by camel. And so now they had no cars. And so they done rode the beast of burden all the way from Syria 
to Samaria. And when he gets there, <laughs> Elisha does not stop what he's doing to even go to the door, but he sends his servants to tell him Elisha said. <laughs> I want y'all to see how, how humbling of an experience this is for, for Naaman because in his position, y'all, he was used to always giving orders. He never had to take them. Y'all remember the centurion saw, I say unto one, go, and he goeth. <laughs> I say unto another, come, and he cometh. But the text says, y'all, that Naaman is reduced to having to take orders. And Elijah doesn't even come outside to tell him. He sends his servant to say it for him. And, and that's why in verse 11, that Naaman goes off. Look at verse 11. Naaman just losing. Because this, this is messing with him because he's used to being honored. But now it don't seem like Elijah understands who I am. He's, he's, not, he's not acting like I'm, I'm the person of power and position. He didn't even come outside. So look what he said. But Naaman was wroth. That means mad. That means real mad. We don't say, we don't say uh, wroth nowadays, but that means real mad. He ready to blow something up, burn the whole thing down. And went away saying, look at, it, look at this, behold, I thought <laughs> he will surely come out to me. Now, I'm, now y'all know, you know who I am, Elijah. So surely he will come, out to, come outside to me and stand, y'all see it right there in, in, in the verse, and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. This is what y'all need to see. Naaman, you can't fix your own situation. So why do you come to the man who can with your own expectations of how he got to do it? If you knew how to fix leprosy, then what you coming to me for? Y'all know that this is how the Lord talks to us sometimes? Because we tell God, we go to him and we pray and tell God how to fix all our situations. And God looking at you like, if you could fix it, then what you call me for? <laughs> Why are you call me if you can handle it? If you know how everything should go, what you calling me for? He trying to run down to Elijah how it should go. Now, now on the surface, y'all, it might look like Elijah was being extra. Because at least, y'all, he could have came outside. Because even, you know, if the man came from a long way, you know, you're a man of position and power. And sometimes I'll learn it's better to just go ahead and just go and get to him. Because y'all know there's some folks right now, I'm talking about in great church. I'm talking about in the great church. That if you say the wrong title, they will go off. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you, listen, that ain't what your mama named you. <laughs> I understand out of respect what we do, but if I, if I mess around and miss it, and I miss a wrong or two, that don't mean go off. Because when we all get to heaven, <laughs> he go, my name is going to be Brandon. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you now. And, and, so, and so, I thought, well, Elijah, you being a little extra, you could at least came, came outside. But when I looked a little deeper, y'all, the Lord opened my eyes to see that in reality, y'all, Elijah helped Naaman because the way he handled him, it helped to humble him. Okay. Uh, he, he, the way he was handled, Lord have mercy, I see it. Great pandemic. It helped to humble him. Because some of us thought that the government could save us. We thought we had enough money saved. You thought your medical plan was enough. You thought your name was strong enough. And some of us just think we can talk our way out of anything, <laughs> no matter where we are. But the way Elisha handled him, it humbled him. And here's why. This is how it helped him. Because humility always comes before healing. God cannot heal us in places where we have not been humbled. God won't heal it if you keep acting like you can handle it. So that's why we lift our hands and we tell Lord help us because we're saying to God, I got some stuff in my hands that I can't handle, so I'm giving it to you. Lord have mercy. And some of us come to God and, and we are in pride and God says, if you can handle it, then what you call me for? <laughs> James 4 and 6, it tells us, but he giveth grace, more grace. Wherefore he said, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Y'all know that sometimes you can get more from God by just throwing yourself at the mercy of the court. See, when you come to God based on merit, God look at you like you're crazy. Because the blood that covers you is the blood that Jesus shed. That wasn't your blood. The reason you're alive is because I kept you. It wasn't because you were so smart. 
And so when we come to God as if God ought to do it, based on merit, we miss it. When we go to God, we go based on mercy. That's why my grandmama used to say, Lord, have mercy. When she didn't know what to pray and what to say, she would just open up her mouth and say, Lord, have mercy. And I believe that in that one, Lord, have mercy, there was medicine in the Lord, have mercy. It was saving her children with the Lord, have mercy. It was paying bills with the Lord, have mercy. You ought to look at somebody and say, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. <laughs> Sometimes we don't know what to pray. Sometimes I walk in what? And I see somebody that just keep on messing with me. I say, Lord, have mercy. Because I don't know what to say at the moment. When, 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 I, when, I, when I got my nose swabbed, they said, you're positive. I said, Lord, have mercy. Uh-huh. And 11 days later, yeah, I was on the other side of what some folk died in. That, that when I thought that I was going down for the last time, all I said was, Lord, have mercy. And now I'm on the other side of what I thought was going to take me out. Every now and then, you ought to look up to heaven when you don't know what to pray and say, Lord, have mercy. Oh, Jesus. Uh-huh. I'm going to show you this and I'm going to get out of here. I've been up here way too long. I'm trying to tell you, it's going to work. But you got to accept help from the right people. Got to choose humility, reject pride. Here's the last thing I want to show you. You got to change your mindset and trust the process. Because look at verse 13. Look at verse 13. I'm trying to, this way, I did all that to get here. And his servants came there and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had been thee, Lord, do something great. Wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then, when he said to thee, Wash and be clean? So here's what he's saying. Now, if he would have told you, to build him a, a vacation resort, you would have done it. If he would have told you to climb to the highest mountain in Samaria, you would have done it. If he would have told you to swim across a lake full of crocodiles to get your healing, you would have done it. He said, but what he's telling you to do is really not that hard. So if he had told you to do something hard, would you not have done it? Now what he's referring to is that in verse 10, when Elijah's servant comes out to Naaman, he says, go wash in Jordan seven times and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shall be clean. He says, go wash yourself in Jordan. Now the problem with the Jordan is, it was dirty. And so it's kind of like going out there, somebody tell you right now, go out there and get you a big cup of water out of Lake Pine Bluff and drink it all, drink it all of it. No, I ain't either. <laughs> I don't want a unicorn horn, I don't now I'm trying to keep myself together. I, I ain't going to tempt the Lord to have to save me after I drink the water. So, so, so the Jordan River, it was a dirty river. But here's what he don't understand, y'all. He doesn't understand why God chose this river for it. Because, because he's, he's, he still has the wrong mindset, but y'all have to understand something, that there's still some pride in Naaman. And when I look at the geography of Jordan, the Jordan River is the lowest river in the world. So even though he'd been through some stuff that brought him low, he wasn't low enough. God said, you still think that you can do this stuff on your own. You still think you got enough money to fix everybody's problems. You still think that you got all the words to say and that you can handle every situation going on in your life. You're not low enough. Go down to the river Jordan and dip seven times. Then in verse 12, Naaman goes off again. Are not uh, Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And what this reveals, his name is mindset. Because Naaman has a crippling and contagious condition and there is no cure. And he tells him to go down there and dip in the water. But he was more concerned about being comfortable than being cured. I'm trying to tell you that some of the people around you, they want you to do for them what they won't do for themselves. They want to be comfortable and want you to do all of the work. But if you really want to be cured, you have to do whatever it is the Lord says. So his mindset tells him that what the prophet asked me to do 
It's too humiliating and it's too hard. Have y'all ever been connected to a person who, whatever you tell them, they can always find a reason why it won't work. You tell them, I'm going to tell you how to go get a new job. Well, I can't do that because I ain't got no internet. I'm going to tell you what you can do to get your money. Well, I can't do that because I can't get all my stuff together. They tell you, well, if you go down there, they're, well, I can't do that because they don't like black people down there. I'm too short. I'm too tall. They don't like bright-skinned people. They don't like dark skin. Whatever you tell them, they always got a reason why it won't work or it won't work for them. But in verse 13, because God always gives us one of these. In verse 13, one of Naaman's servants, I'm tired of listening to this foolishness. And he speaks up and speaks truth to power. And the Bible says, he says to Naaman, my father, if the prophet had told you to do something hard, would you not have done it? Would you have gone out there and done it if he told you to do something big? So he said, you know what? I think you're right. I'm going to go do what you say. He goes out and he prepares to dip himself in the river. But here's what you got to see, though. That in order for Naaman to dip in the Jordan, he has to take off his armor in front of all these people. Which I remember now that his hard exterior facade, that's what's keeping people from seeing that he's really sick. It's his armor that, that he has on the outside that, that keeps people from seeing what's going on on the inside. He wears this hard exterior shell like he don't need nobody. I'm talking to somebody. He got this hard exterior shell like and every time you get close, he gets angrier. Or he wants to reject people because he's trying to keep people away because his armor covers the fact that he's really afflicted. But in order to dip, he has to take off all of his armor in front of all of those people and dip in the Jordan. Which means, y'all, that this has to work. Because now when he takes off his armor, everybody can see what he's been hiding. Lord have mercy. And if this does not work, that means that his life is ruined. So he go down there because he ain't got no options. But here's why you got to stick to the process. Because in verse 14, the text says that he went down and dipped himself seven times. How many times? Seven times in the Jordan. So here's what that means. Which means that he dipped one time and nothing happened. Lord have mercy. Now he's looking around like I was on that platform. Lord, what's about to happen here? He dipped two times. No change. Three times. Now he's looking at everybody around him because he's trying to figure out now if I, this don't work, which way I'm going to run? Because they're going to try to capture me and take me to the leper colony. Four times. Nothing happened. Five times. Six times. And nothing changed. Now he's sitting there looking around. He's, he's naked and exposed in front of everybody. And I believe in that moment he's struggling because I ain't got no plan B. I'm talking to somebody who you're in a situation now you ain't got no plan B. That if God don't do it, it won't be done. That the doctor said it ain't going to change. That the, that the doctor says there is no help. You ain't got no plan B. So all I can do is trust God. All I can do is believe that he'll do what he says he'll do. So six times and nothing happens. But here's why, y'all. You got to stick to the process. Because the prophet didn't tell him six times. The prophet said seven times. And when he goes down the seventh time, the text says that he comes up out of the water with the skin of a newborn child and he was totally clean. You got to stick to it because it's going to work. Tell your neighbor, it's going to work. It's going to work. It's going to work. It's going to work. But the only way it's going to work is if you accept help from the right people. If you choose humility and reject your pride. And if we change our mindsets and trust the process, the Lord told me to tell you that it's going to work. Everybody stand. Everybody stand. Everybody stand. I'm going to pray real quick, every head bowed, every eye closed. Because God says, it was God's intention that we did not have a plan B. Some of us say, Lord, what's next? God said, no, nah, what's now? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So God says, I'm trying to tell you that you don't need a plan B because ain't nothing wrong with plan A. 
All you have to do is believe what I have spoken to you. Believe the word that I have given you. And it's going to work. And I'm praying that somebody who's listening to me, every head bowed, every eye closed, who's listening to me right now, I'm praying that somebody that has heard this word, so I just want to know how is my life going to come back together again? Who can help me in the situations that I'm struggling in? Is there light at the end of my tongue? I come to tell you that there is, and his name is Jesus. And if you believe on him, as the scriptures have said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And if today you want to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm trying to tell you that when you give your life to him, it's going to work. It's 100% guaranteed that when you accept Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior, that your sins will be forgiven, that your slate will be wiped clean, never to be remembered again. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10 verse 9 that if thou wilt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, you shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And if that's you today, you want to give your life to the Lord, I want you to repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. But I know that you are the son of God. I believe that you came, that you lived, and you died. That you rose again with all power in your hands. And if I receive you into my heart as my Lord and Savior, I have a right to the tree of life. So I'm asking you right now, save me, Jesus. Come into my heart, be my Lord and my Savior. And I will be your child. And right now, I receive you by faith, and I am saved. Put your hands together for those who have received salvation today. Amen. It is going to work. It is going to work. And at this time, we're preparing our hearts to partake in Holy Communion together as a family of faith. And so I would that all of you, even now, would get your elements together if you have crackers, if you have bread whatever type of juice or anything that you're going to use uh, the Bible says that every time we do this we are to do this in remembrance of him and so we're getting back to the basics the principle of what Holy Communion uh, represents for us that we are partaking of the blood and the body of Jesus Christ that we are partaking of the suffering of Christ as sons and daughters of him and so as we prepare to partake in Holy Communion, I'm going to read into your hearing uh, these words of Paul penned to uh, the church at Corinth in his first letter to them, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to read verse 23 through verse 26. And then after I have, con after I have concluded my reading, then we will partake in Holy Communion together. Here are the words of Paul, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye drink, as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Let us pray. Dear eternal God, our Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy this morning. We thank you for opening doors and making ways. We thank you for yet another opportunity, God, to partake in holy communion in obedience to your word. And I pray right now, God, that every person that's going to take Take it, Holy Communion, God, if there be any unconfessed sin, they will confess those sins to you now. I pray, God, if there's anyone who has offended someone knowingly, I pray right now, God, that they would reach out and ask for forgiveness for the trespass. I'm simply asking, God, now that you would accept our worship this morning by way of Holy Communion. And I pray, God, that if there be any sick among us, God, that healing would take place in their bodies. Pray, God, that every deficit be filled, every crooked place be made straight as we partake in Holy Communion in obedience to your word. We thank you and we give you glory for it now when we count it as done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. If you would, um, get your elements of the bread, which represents the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. 
And he said, this is my body that was broken for you. Eat. Likewise, he took the cup. He said, this is the New Testament in my blood. Shed just for you. Drink ye all of it. Amen and amen. Put your hands together right there for the goodness and the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we thank God for all of you worshiping with us this morning. And if you, by chance, are one of those persons who gave your life to the Lord this morning, we want to know who you are. Put that in the comment section. I received Jesus. Everything we do is to get somebody to the decision-making point to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And if you accepted Jesus Christ this morning, we want to know who you are right now. Go ahead and put that in the comment section. I received Jesus. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. And we are excited for our new brothers and sisters in Christ. Main Street. As soon as you see somebody drop in their comment section that they received Jesus, literally go crazy. Put some fire in that chat. Send up some hearts and some likes. Uh, put some hand clap emojis in there. We want to celebrate our new brothers and sisters in Christ. Heaven is rejoicing and we are too. Also, if the Lord has impressed upon your heart to be a member of the Main Street Church of God in Christ, I want to tell you that we have a place here for you and we want you to be here. We believe that you belong here and we want to be able to say welcome home to you. And so if you want to join the Main Street Church of God in Christ right now, all you have to do is super simple. Just drop it in the comments section. I want to be a member. Even if you don't live in the greater Pine Bluff area, that's fine because all of our worship services, all of our teaching ministries, and even many of our fellowships are virtual. And so you have an opportunity to connect from anywhere in the world. And so if the Lord is calling you to be a part of us, now is the time he has made way for that to take place by way of technology and we want you to be a part of us we want to be your church family and i want to be your pastor so right now if you want to be a member of main street drop that in the comment section i want to be a member and if by chance you say well pastor i've given my life to the lord or i want to be a member but i don't want to put my information in the comment section that's fine use that link in the details portion click to connect and you'll be able to give us your information through a secure platform and a member of our intake team will reach out to you with next steps listen do it today we are excited about you main street one more time give a hand clap of praise to all of our new brothers and sisters in christ and all of those who are now members are going to become members of the main street church of god in christ we applaud you and your decision and we're ready to do life together Amen. Even now, we're preparing our hearts to give, and we thank God that he has prospered us in a pandemic. We have started the year off strong, and we want to continue that. We do not want the sacrifice we make for ministry just to be a New Year's resolution. We want it to be a lifestyle change, and we know that God gives us the 100%. He owns it all. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. But he tells us to bring the tenth, bring ye the tithe into the storehouse. And so that's where we are here at the church, the place where you receive your spiritual nourishment and your spiritual food, the place that you are a member is the storehouse for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ here on earth. And so then a tenth or 10% 10 of all of your increase is to be given as a tithe to be in obedience with the word. And so we know that our tithe we owe and our offering we sow. And so when we're giving offering, it gives us an opportunity to literally get seed in the ground. And if you are able to sow the seed into ministry, God will multiply what you give and he will give you back more. The Bible simply says he gives seed to the sower. Amen. So in order to be a sower, you have to sow seed of what you have. So today we're asking you to be diligent, hear God, be obedient to his word as it relates to the tithe, and hear God in terms of what he wants you to sow into ministry as it relates to your offerings. But wherever you are, I want you to get that in your mind and I want you to do it now. Here's how you can do it. You can use that link, click to give, and you'll be connected to our online secure giving platform. You'll be able to see directly into the ministry of the Main Street Church of God in Christ. Also, if you want to give via cash app, use the cash tag, dollar sign, Main Street C-O-G-I-N. 
see and you'll be able to sow seed into ministry today listen we are so excited about what the lord is going to do in our lives and in our lives together and we're looking forward to it so we want you to join us this wednesday for bible study as we're continuing our series managing me and next sunday i want you to celebrate with us myself lady jessica and the entire main street family and our fourth pastor and wife appreciation service it has been a tremendous ride and just to have an opportunity to stop and reflect on what the lord has done in our lives as pastor and people is going to be an exciting time and so we want you to be there to worship and enjoy that experience with us listen i love you i see you in the future and you look so much better than you do right now god bless you and we will see you even tonight for ypww Wednesday for Bible study and next Sunday we're going to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness as we always do here at the Main Street Church of God in Christ. God bless you and we'll see you tonight.